The first item on the agenda, 4.01, are public comments on agenda items. The public comment period is a time slot set aside on the agenda for citizens to address the Board of Education. The open meetings law does not require that citizens be allowed to participate and speak at Board of Education meetings other than public hearings. The law specifies that the public has a right to attend board meetings except for executive sessions. The procedure for public comment is outlined in Board Policy 1230, Citizen Participation. A total of 30 minutes is set aside for public comment at the beginning and end of the meeting. The maximum time allowed for any one speaker is three minutes. Public comments at the beginning of the meeting are limited to items on the agenda. Persons who wish to participate in the public comment portion of the meeting must state their name and the specific topic about which they wish to speak. As speakers must limit comments to issues appropriate for public discussion, compliments or complaints about student discipline, specific student issues, or personnel must not be addressed during public comment. Interruption of board discussion is not permitted. In the interest of civility and respect for different points of view, outbursts from the audience, applause, or other types of disturbances or disruptions are not permitted. Under no circumstances will booing be tolerated. The Board of Education recognizes its responsibility to hear and respond to public comment. As stated in Board Policy 1230, the board is not able to answer questions at the meetings, but welcomes your statements. Any questions from the public should be submitted through the use of the public comment form, which may be obtained online or at the desk with the district clerk. Responses will be provided within two business days on the district's public comment responses page so that everyone may receive the information. Does anyone wish to address the board at this time? Good evening. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, my name is Cheryl Megas. I live in the town of Poughkeepsie, and I'd like to make a few comments on agenda items 6.02 and 6.04. First, with regard to the Smart Schools Bond Act, while we have put through two uh, very valuable uh, proposals so far, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, what the status is in terms of response and reimbursement from the state. Are we continuing to put out money for these things without having received anything back yet from the state? And if that's the case, um, shouldn't we uh, look to see that some of the money comes back into our pocket before we put more out? And the second item, the um, proposed change in start times for next year. Last year, or two years ago when this came up, I was a, a big proponent of it. I was speaking at board meetings in favor of it. And while the board and the administration have been gathering information and thinking more deeply into this, so am I. And I'm wondering if we've really looked at the impact that having both the junior and senior high schools running at the same time is going to have on traffic in the local community. I don't know what it's like in the southern part of the district, but if you've ever been in this Middle Bush Myers Corner corridor between six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning, it gets really congested as it is. I can't imagine what it's gonna be like having more buses coming down Myers Corners Road to the junior high and more parents with band instruments and other things driving children into school. Um, and also, I know when we have school trips from the junior high, commuters going to the train station complain about the impact on their commute time that they're caught in traffic trying to get down Middle Bush Road. And if we move the junior high start time earlier, I'm wondering if we're gonna start getting bottlenecks on Middle Bush Road that are gonna affect the community on a daily basis. Also, while one of the things that I was very much in favor of was a, large, a later start time for the high schools, I'm wondering if with all this congestion, 
we're going to have any gain at all in that 15 minutes or if our students are going to have to be on the buses at the same time they are now or even earlier to compensate for all of the traffic congestion. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else who wishes to comment at this time? Okay. Seeing no one, we'll move to board comments. Um, Mrs. Laval. I was disappointed to see that uh, discussion of the i rating assessments was not on the agenda as uh, several board members had requested. Um, the assessments were being given last week and this week. They are being used to measure student achievement of, uh, of the Common Core Learning Standards. Um, they're being given to every student, and we are going to use them to develop and direct curriculum and instruction based on the student performance as measured against the existing standards. And this very week, the Commissioner of Education stated that 60% of the ELA standards are being revised and 55% of the math standards are being revised. Are we going to redirect curriculum instruction to standards that are 60% and 55% respectively in need of revision? And then get rid of it next year when the standards change? We measured our students against standards that the commissioner says need revision, substantial revision, 60 and 55%. Um, so, so either we're going to write curriculum to bad standards or we're not going to use the assessments. Why are we giving them and why are we not discussing them? It, it's such a significant concern. It's all of the curriculum and, instru and instruction for all of our students in K through eight against standards that the commission herself has said are insufficient and erroneous. I, I don't understand how the Board of Education is not discussing it. I'd like to know from the district what we're doing with these assessments. Are we going to write curriculum aimed at standards that we're not going to use anymore? Or are we going to throw out these assessments and have wasted the time that these students and teachers spent taking them? There are, those are the only two options. Either way, we've assessed our children against standards. The commissioner is substantially revising. For the life of me, I can't understand why we're not even discussing it. How much money are we spending on the assessments, on the curriculum and instruction and professional development aimed at standards that we're changing? I hope the board will consider it and put it on a very immediate agenda to discuss and consider what we're spending our taxpayers' money on and what our children are spending their time doing. Mrs. Pelton. Uh, well, since this, the actual committee reports are at the business meeting, and this is a workshop meeting, but you can, of course, mention that you had the policy committee meeting. <laughs> Mr. Slowshow.
completing my uh, New York State School Board Association training up in Albany with uh, my fellow uh, new board members. One interesting topic was on the agenda, which I'd like to share with you. It was a presentation given by the Central New York Regional Information Center. The topic was data used for accountability and student achievement. The presentation was an eye-opener for me and many other school board members throughout the uh, state that I spoke to uh, during lunch breaks and riding the elevator and just speaking with after our training was over. The uh, facilitators had some difficulty answering numerous questions that were proposed to them about exactly uh, how the data is collected and how the data is going to be used. And that was a bit concerning to me and I think mostly everyone that was attending. Um, it, it seemed to me that the information that they're collecting is flawed. They're not collecting the information properly. They're not using all of the potential graduation dates. Uh, there seems to be a bit of confusion in my understanding, or at least my interpretation, on how they track uh, cohorts. Uh, you could be a homeschool child, 10th uh, grade, but be classified as an 8th grader based on your test scores. So that changes uh, some of the, uh, the numbers for the cohorts. The other thing that was concerning is that they don't really know what to do with the data once they get it. So the way they're trying to interpret it, they're receiving flawed data, in my opinion, and then they're using the flawed data to determine what to do. That was very concerning to me, and quite frankly, was a bit frightening. Uh, it appears to me that the State Education Department really doesn't know what it's doing with this particular data that's collected from all the students. And that should be a concern for all of us Hopefully, moving forward, we'll have some uh, conversation with the board. I won't take up too much more time on that. Thank you. Mrs. Karat? Mr. Rubin? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting with Mrs. Watkins to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Community Communications Committee, uh, just in terms of how we're getting our next meeting set up and going. As a representative to both I uh, attended their audit committee, their policy committee, as well as their regular committee meetings. Uh, made school visits to uh, John Jay High School, as well as Vassar Road Elementary School. And uh, Madam President, I had the distinct pleasure of spending the day with you up in Albany. I'll let you talk about that. Mrs. Goodman. Is it? Yes. Thank you. All right, first of all, I want to say thank you to Crosstown, a jazz band of John Jay and Ketchum Seniors, which is how it got its name, which played for the um, gala at Grinnell a couple of weeks ago, which is a fundraising, um, I guess party, actually, a fundraising event for the Grinnell Library in the Village of Wappingers. Just the fact that six seniors gave up part of their Saturday night to me is really impressive. What is also impressive was the lovely spirit in which they did it and the lovely music that they played. So I just wanted to give them a thank you and they didn't give the name of their teacher, so whoever their teacher is should also be commended. Um, it is also worth noting to parents that if you have any concerns about the state standards, now is the time to express them to the state of New York. The revised standards are available in draft form. And go to nyse.gov to get the exact link. As reported in the New York Times, which quoted the commissioner, Mary Ellen Elia, it is true that 50 to 60% of the standards are changing, but about half of those standards, according to her, are very minor word changes. And these standards are the result of work by parents and teachers. This time, it is not a top-down corporate effort. So hopefully, um, now is the time to have your say, if you're interested. Good luck. Mr. Lovian. 
I concur with what she had just said regarding the standards. I think it's extremely important that parents are so concerned about standards, they make their comments known to the commission earlier. So I comment here for stated now. Mr. Galletta. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with uh, Ms. Goodman's comments as well and mention and uh, Mr. Laval and, and Mr. Slowshow. Um, that after a you know a year long effort with the, with the state's Common Core Task Force, uh, taking a, another look at the standards um, with input from many more stakeholders, um, there there is going to be a transition to to, to adjusted standards. Um, it's my understanding that it's going to they're hoping to to vote on a new standard sometime at the beginning of the, uh, next year and implement them uh, have a, a better transition than previously and maybe um, two years down the line. To, to implement the standards. So there's gonna be uh, a better transition than, than there was last time. And in the meantime, we need to evaluate and, and test our students on the standards that are in place. Um, as Ms. Goodman mentioned, there has been uh, changes to many of the standards, but the core of the standards have remained intact. Um, so I think that's important to understand. And also, to Mr. Slowshower's point, um, they're, they're also starting a an accountability task force or think tank that's that I believe Mr. Rubin we're approving Mr. Rubin we're, we're voting on Mr. Rubin attending that that um, session tonight um, so the state understands that there's issues with the accountability system so they're they're in, incorporating this this ESSA uh, every student to see that uh, task force to 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 look at those uh, processes so the state is, is working towards making corrections to some of the things that many people have expressed concerns about over the past few years, and, and I think it's, it's welcome, welcome changes. I, I first of all, I'd like to commend uh, Mr. Slowshower, Mr. Galletta, and Mrs. Goodman for attending the new board officer training up in Albany. It is required, but they made the effort to go and do it in, uh, in person rather than online, which is very good and uh, they have a lot to share with us from there. The uh, policy committee met under Chairman uh, Mrs. Pelton and uh, with uh, Mrs. Karath and Mr. Lumia and myself, and the audit committee under Mrs. Laval met with Mr. Slowshow and Mr. Galetta and myself, and those chairs will have reports for the committee along with the Capital Improvement Committee, Legislative Action Committee, and other committees that meet at the next uh, business meeting of the board. To make it more efficient, we're ha having all the committee reports once a month at the business meeting. This is a workshop meeting, just so everyone knows, where we have lots of presentations. Now, Mr. as Mr. Rubin said, he and I had the opportunity to attend board officer training up in Latham, New York. It was uh, very interesting and productive. Uh, we heard a presentation by the board president and the superintendent of Pinkett Corning Painted Post, and it was interesting to hear how many things uh, over the last 20 years they have gone through that we did here in our district also, and uh, we were happy to see that we followed many of the good suggestions that they made, and uh, we'll, under Mr. Carrion's able direction, we hope to continue that way. Uh, we also had some uh, inter interactions with other board members around the state and learned a great deal. Was there anything you wanted to add to that, Mr. Rubin? It was a great day, that's it. Great day, it really was, very valuable. All right, next, the superintendent's report, Mr. Carrion. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Education. Uh, before I get started, this is our first meeting where we see many, some of our seniors, <laughs> and we're gonna see many of the seniors walking in through these doors. Um, congratulations, this is your last year in public school, and um, this is really exciting. Um, make sure you, if you're 18, you exercise your right to vote. Um, that's very important. I stole that from a trustee sitting right here. And the other piece is that um, what I always share with the seniors and Sometimes I say my seniors because um, I'm really just so excited that you're in this journey and you're about to end your career, but have a lot of fun, stay engaged in learning and be safe, be safe and have a good time and, and truly respect each and every one of your classmates and be a role model to those juniors, sophomores and freshmen that 
are now walking the hallways and um, just enjoy a great year. Thank you. In addition to that, um, I wanted, I did share that I would mention that we did start off with our universal screening. Um, and with the universal screening, all of our schools are running on schedule. We haven't had any really real mishaps or anything of that nature. Um, no, no, no things that were reported to central office. We visited the schools to see how the students are um, faring with the assessment. In addition to that, um, we will be sending letters to all of the parents indicating um, the results and also indicating what measures we're going to be taking um, for those students that will be, um, their results will be above and beyond grade level as well as as well as for those students who are in grade level, and as for those students as we are required to do so, um, to provide academic intervention support services. Um, we have looked at some of the assessments, we even to the point where we've personalized it to see a, a score and, and really try to match up if, the, if there was a lot of accuracy to what, what, what um, the results were. But more importantly, I think right now that as educators, we'll be able to really look and just provide parents with, um, um, with an outlook in terms of how their students are faring. We know that um, to many students were at about 60% with the test refusal, and um, we, we, we can't count on those assessments, and of course there is conversations about the assessments, the assessments itself, and the validity of those assessments. But in terms of providing this universal screener, this is a local, um, this is local to the district. We've piloted it, and we've seen the accuracy that the, te the schools that did the pilots last year, and um, that's why we continue to move forward. As I mentioned in the past too, we are still very much required by Education Law 3012 DAPPR to provide an assessment. So this is one assessment that since the, well, RTI response to intervention has been out since 2006, but in 2010 the official document for response to intervention was released and um, we are responsible to provide and look at pre-assessments and post-assessments for students. We don't plan on testing the students three times a year. We are only plan on looking at those students who will require additional um, intervention supports and see how they're faring and they will probably be, they will be the only students who we will um, provide the assessment to come um, in January. The other piece that I'd like to share also is that academic intervention services, I think, for, for example, when I was a young student, if you went to reading class, you went to reading class for the whole year. And what AIS and academic intervention support services and re response to intervention provides is the opportunity for, its kid, for students to come in and out of um, those type of classes and programs based on the progress that they're making. So that is definitely one benefit to be able to target some of the skills that students may need. Um, a good reading program still constitutes understanding word recognition, phonemic awareness, psych vocabulary, um, fluency, and comprehension. So if we're looking at our universal screeners, these are the things that are much more universal in scope to make determination in terms of how our students are faring in terms of literacy. Sit Frank 01, Annual External Financial Statements for 2015 to 2016, presented, presented by the Bonadeo Group. conversation about the 2015-16 external audit. Behind me is uh, lead auditor, Mr. Joseph Perot from the Bonadio Group, 
and he will be explaining the draft financials that were shared with the audit committee last week. Good evening. As Kristen said, I met with the audit committee last week. Um, went over these financial statements, a couple minor changes based on that, typos here and there, nothing uh, of any substance. Before I start, I want to thank Kristen and the rest of the business office. Um, very efficient, allowed us to get a, a, in and out. You know, we, we requested things, they quick to respond. Um, it's not always we have clients that are so responsive, so it's, it's good to have that. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole, what is it, 65 page report. Um, I know you guys had a lot on your agenda. So I'm going to start with just the summary um, auditor results. It's the schedule of findings and question costs. It should be the last two pages in your in the uh, financial report. Financial statements: the type of uh, auditor's report issued unmodified. That's the highest level of assurance. Um, financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects. No issues at all with that. No material weaknesses no significant deficiencies. The one issue that we did have, and it's a repeat from last year, although it has improved, the non-compliance materials with the financial statements, your fund balance, as I'm sure you're aware, is in excess of the 4% state limit. Um, you're at 5.61, you're making strides to reduce it. I know there's a response in here, what your plans are, you've got some capital projects, considering other things with, you know, to, to help alleviate things for the taxpayers, so. You can look at that also. Under federal awards, a um, few changes under there this year. They changed the terminology. It went from A133 to uniform guidance. Along with that, they changed some testing, um, enhanced it a little bit, changed the dollar threshold down below. You'll see dollar threshold for type A and type B programs, $750,000. Um, but again, we issued an unmodified opinion or report there. Um, again, no issues, no internal control issues, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, and no findings that were required to be reported in accordance with the uniform guidance. And the program we tested this year was Title I. Off the top of my head, I don't remember which, it was two schools we picked from. No. And it's a cheaper to Title Yeah, so no issues there. Um, it went well. So that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Do any board members have questions? Mr. Lumia. Is there a, is there a time frame whereby... So I just wanted to say thank you to Joe. Thank you very much. Did a good job. <laughs> the, the percentage that Joe indicated was 5.91, 5 5.61. 5.61%. 5 okay. So remember, last year the Board of Education approved the movement of funds for three projects: Bob Junior's floor, which looks lovely, uh, Evans roof, and also district-wide carbon monoxide detectors, which were a, a mandate from New York State. Those funds have been earmarked, they haven't been moved. So the 5.61% that he references in the report he has to, we are really only at 4.85%. So we still do have a balance that we need to use and we will be having conversations with the Board of Education as we move forward. With regard to when it's supposed to be 4%, that's June 30th. So at June 30th of any school year, we are supposed to be at 4%. So we are at 4.85% because we already have earmarked those funds to move for those other projects. Okay, I just want to, I don't know if I'm out to make suggestions at this point regarding how to spend the rest of the funds. But the slice hour has been always an advocate of having uh, testing for uh, chlorine against all the schools, so perhaps some of that funds can be used to, to look for uh, systems to, work to, to test the water. Perhaps. Well, we'll definitely take that in consideration as the administration has the discussion, share it with the superintendent, and we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Just one, I just one, thing. Oh, sorry. one more thing I forgot to say. They're in draft format right now. We're not going to make any changes to them. Um, it's just draft, just so I can get here and present them to you so you can look at them. And the due date is October 15th, which I believe is a Saturday this year. So. Mrs. Lavalle, did you have a question? Yeah. 
if we're at 5.61, but really 4.85, um, I assume there were no consequences for not having moved the difference on June 30th or last year. We actually cannot, based on accounting standards and policy. So if you are to follow proper accounting, we cannot move those funds until expended. So we're in the process. We've spent them now because the work has been completed or is almost completed, so we're working through that process. Um, in our management letter, which the board will receive, we are required by New York State to file a, a, a management letter with um, the Office of the State Controller within 120 days. So the board will see that and the plan will be clearly defined. That will be the only item that is included because that's the only finding. Um, but we will, by that point in time, have laid out a plan for discussion and for sharing as we move forward. What I'd like to add is, in addition to the fact that the projects, we budgeted for these projects at a certain dollar amount, they came in a little bit lower, which is fantastic, except when we have to use that fund balance. So it's kind of a, a balancing act as well as we move forward. So we will continue to monitor um, 4.85. It's never good to be at 4.85. It's never good to be over four, but we are happy to at least to have this small of a happy problem. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Rubin. Mrs. Crandall, thank you for running a tight financial ship. I think this, uh, this is a modified highest level of uh, compliment that you can receive. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, we can see why Wapinger spends the least per, per uh, student in Dutchess County, because Mrs. Crandall figures out how we can give an excellent education for not too much money. Thank you. <laughs> Six point zero two Smart School Bond Act Implementation Plan Number Three. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Education, Jose Carrion. Uh, my name is Art Chapman. I am the Director of Instructional Technology, and this evening I'll be presenting on the Smart Schools Bond Act Implementation Plan Number Three. Just a little background on the purpose of the Smart Schools Bond Act. It is to install high-speed broadband or wireless internet connectivity for schools and communities. To acquire learning technology equipment or uh, facilities included but not limited to interactive whiteboards, computer servers, and desktop laptop and tablet computers. Uh, construct, enhance, and modernize educational facilities to accommodate pre-K programs and to provide instructional space to replace classroom trailers and or install high-tech security features in school buildings and on school campuses, including but not limited to video surveillance, emergency notification systems, and physical access controls. The Wappinger Central School District was allocated $5,327,266. Uh, we were able to establish our stakeholders. Voter approval is not, is not required when SSBA is the sole fund. Private and parochial schools uh, must be and are included. There's no minimum per category. NYSEN must approve our technology plan, which they have. There's no deadline for our expenditures. All plans must receive final approval from the NYSEN SSBA Review Board. All funds are distributed on reimbursement basis. Capital improvements must follow NYSEN capital improvement processes and approved expenditures will be reimbursed within 90 days for request. Our SSBA committee is made up of 21 members consisting of community members, parents, teachers, and administrators. We've had several meetings over the past year. Our latest meeting 
was on June 15th of 2016, right before the end of the school year. Um, the purchasing status of him, where we discussed the purchasing status of implementation plan number one, which was our interactive display technology, our Promethean boards, all 200 were installed before the start of the school year. The planning and submittal process must include consultation with parents, teachers, students, community members, other stakeholders, and any non-public schools located in the district. The district developed and the school board approved a preliminary smart schools investment plan. The preliminary plan was posted on the district website for at least 30 days, an address to which all written comments on the plan should be sent to plans at wcsdny.org. A hearing that enables stakeholders to respond to the preliminary plan, which this one will be the October meeting or the very first one in November. And a final plan for school board approval and such plan has been approved by the school board. Tonight's presentation for implementation plan number three is actually a two part plan. <coughs> The first is looking at student technology, primarily on our K-8 level. Currently what you see before you is the access our elementary students have to technology in their individual buildings based on if they have a computer lab. And you will see that most of the buildings up there, including Fringerhoff, Fishkill, Fishkill Plains, Oak Grove, and Sheaf do not have a physical computer lab, which most of us are more familiar with. However, each building has an assortment of mobile labs or mobile carts. These include Chromebook carts, iPad carts, Lenovo's, which are a netbook cart, as well as Apple MacBooks. You'll see that these numbers vary from building to building, depending on the size of the building. And across the bottom is a total number of carts per building. Uh, total for Brinkerhoff is three, Evans five, Fishkill four, Fishkill Plains four, Gayhead 7, Oak 4, Myers 8, Sheep 6, Vassar 3, and Kindred is at 4. This particular slide looks at the number of devices versus the number of students in the building. You will see that the district average is at 2.82 students per device. So for every device in the district, we have, if we round that up, three children per device, three students. With the exceptions of Evans and Kinry, all of our other elementary buildings are above that average. Uh, Brinkerhoff being the worst at almost three and a half students per device. During our Smart Schools Bond Act committee meetings, uh, various concerns were expressed by our teachers, including due to departmentalized schedules. Computers are needed for almost the entire day by certain classes, particularly those that are teaching only ELA, only math with a rotation. They're using that with each group of students coming in, so they're using those carts the entire day. Carts are being used on average four and a half out of six and a half hours a day. We expect that with lunch and recess and other activities, gym, art, music, that they're not necessarily always using those devices, which is good to see that they're not always on them. But on average, only two classes in a building are getting to a particular car on a particular day. Between some of our diagnostic programming, curriculum projects, and other new initiatives that we have rolled out, such as our Genius Hour projects, more computers are needed in the buildings. I cannot walk into a building without the teachers going, Mr. Chapel, when are we getting another car? We need another car. When is it coming? When is it coming? When is it coming? Soon, I hope. Uh, there's not enough carts to go around. There's an average of 1.2 com uh, Chromebooks per cart. Those happen to be the device of choice. They're very easy to use. The students are very familiar with them. Uh, in total, there's an average of four and a half carts per building, if you include the computer lab, all the Chromebooks, iPads, netbooks, and MacBooks. This proposal would increase this to add an additional three carts per building on average. The next two slides will show you the building, what they currently have, and what the proposal would in include. Brinker Hoffman would add an additional four carts. Evans, their numbers are doing very well. They don't need additional carts. Their numbers are already very good. Fishkill would have an additional two. Fishkill plans an additional four. 
Gay Head would have an additional six parts. Oak Grove would get two additional, Myers Corners would get five. Chief Road would have an additional three, Vassar Road an additional two carts, Kindred Road yet another building that has done very well with the number of students versus technology, they would not get additional new carts. What do new devices represent for our staff and students? First and foremost, it's greater access to the devices in each building per grade and per wing. This is going to allow us to selectively locate our carts in certain grade levels, on certain floors, so that we're not transporting the carts to and from and having to run them all around. My computer lab TAs, my teachers will tell you, they lose 10 minutes in between class times locating the cart, moving the cart, and setting up the cart again. If it was in a particular wing or on a particular floor or in a particular grade level area, having that cart right there cuts down on time. It also allows the teachers to work together and split up the cart into multiple classrooms simultaneously because it's all right there and nobody's all of a sudden having to gather Chromebooks out of five classrooms and move it down the hall because they're all sharing. It, this will also increase access for students with result to improve digital literacy skills, learning to use computers properly and professionally within the creative classroom environment. <laughs> learning proper typing skills, improve online research where they're doing or using the computers with a purpose, not using the computers for recreation. This will also allow us to diversify projects and tasks within the classroom. The teacher can now, knowing that they have greater access to those devices, be able to break up the class so that certain students are working on a certain project on one of the devices, another group is working on another access or another project in the classroom, Another group might be working on a third piece one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. It allows the teacher to differentiate what is happening within their classroom, providing those resources for students, and allowing the kids to do new projects that they necessarily haven't done because they didn't always have that access to the device. Now that they have a more stable um, schedule and, and regular access, they will be more, the teachers will be more comfortable relying on those computers to work on new projects. In total, this would add 840 devices across our elementary buildings, including an additional 90 devices to replace some aging equipment. Some of our netbooks, some of our Lenovo, some of our MacBooks, which are fantastic. We've had them for many years. They've come to end of life. We can no longer upgrade them. The Chromebooks are much more affordable and allows us to replace those aging MacBooks. Wappingers Junior would also receive an additional 60 devices to balance out their student to, to device ratio as well. On our June 15th meeting, the committee also brought up that the, uh, in this plan they would like to include the purchase of devices for each elementary teacher in all of our elementary buildings at approximately 220 devices for curriculum development and classroom implementation. The committee said you would love, they were all for bringing in these devices, but they said if we're gonna bring in these devices, the teachers need to be able to prepare their lessons and have the materials for their students. So they requested that if we purchase a device for each teacher, those teachers could then use that device to prepare their lessons, prepare their materials, and know how to use that device with the students when the students have them within the classroom. This would bring the approximate number of devices to 1,210 devices, not to exceed $450,000. Part two of this plan is to improve our emergency radio communications across the district. Currently our emergency radios used by staff and administration cannot communicate beyond the immediate confines of each building. In an emergency situation, our access to phones may be compromised and having the ability to communicate via radio is a viable solution. The district will be able to use existing hardware in addition to the purchase of ongoing licensing of radio equipment moving forward. Some of this equipment would include repeaters with IP connect. This would allow for total saturation of radio signals and allow for two talk paths. The IP connect would interconnect with our phone system for PA announcements and even actual phone calls. We'd actually be able to use our radios to access the PA system in the building if our actual phone lines were down. It would also allow us to actually call out if necessary. There'd be additional antennas, wiring, and software. 
The new radios would both be analog and digital that would work with existing equipment, but then we can add additional digital functionality um, that can expand our capability. We would also need site licensing and repeater rentals. This is a breakdown of the cost, looking at the need for the repeaters, the antennas, the radios, site licensing. The repeater rental, uh, at most two sites, but it may depend on some of the above. Grand total cost that we are looking at is $200,200 for all of this work. This would allow us to communicate from one end of the district to the other via radio in case of an emergency. <coughs> On this particular side here, you will see our allocation at the top. The plans listed, number one and number two, these were the projected costs. With the Smart Schools Plan Implementation number one, we actually saved money on both pieces of that project. That was our interactive displays and our door locks. We actually saved money. We checked with the state that money goes back into the till, so to speak. Uh, SSIP plan number two, that is our vestibule plan. That plan is still going through the approval process with the state. This evening we have the third plan, which would be a grand total of $650,200. $29,982 would be generated out of this plan in addition for our private and parochial schools. The budget of $1,933,964 does not include the cost savings. So that money is a little bit higher because of the money that we were able to save in project number one. This just here looks at the private parochial schools specifically, showing that what they were allocated in plan number one, because plan number two was security specific, there was no money allocated to the private or parochial schools. Plan number three, because we do have the technology piece in there, they are allocated $38 per student as well, so there is a chunk there for that, which has a grand total yet to have been spent of $104,148. That was a lot of information. Questions? In order to give every board member an opportunity, I'm going to ask that you ask just one question at a time. If we have additional time, we can go back and ask more. Mr. Galetta, do you have any questions? Mr. Lumia, Mrs. Goodman. What devices will you supply, be supplying the teachers with? We are looking at the ACES Chromebook Flip it is actually a, Mr. Lokin has got his in the back, actually. It is a laptop that flips to a tablet, which becomes very easy because it shows, allows our teachers to have both environments. Mr. Carrion has it there for you. Looks just like a laptop, full attaching keyboard. If he actually flips that piece all the way over, it actually folds right over to a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mr. Lumia. For schools that do not have computer labs, why isn't there more Chromebooks or whatever else increased? For example, up there, she noticed that uh, she broke has no 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 lab yet. The only proposal of increase of three, where uh, Myers has got a lab and got an increase of five. So why is it there's such a discrepancy? There's such a discrepancy because we're looking at the total number of students per building per device. So when you look at Sheep Row, which is a much smaller school compared to a Myers or a Gay Head, um, they're getting fewer devices. It seems like they're getting more, so they're getting three more, but we've also but pumped in. They already have a computer there. Should that also count? We do count those. We count those. Those computer labs count as 30 devices or however many devices happen to be in that lab. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Rosen? Thank you. Um, in terms of the emergency radio communications, and forgive me because I'm not uh, uh, a radio file, if you will, but I do uh, associate with some. Are you okay? Uh, they, they, there are there are radio uh, out there now, emergency radios, where the uh, it's software controlled. Uh, 
so that the, the system that those operators use never goes out of style. Is this a computer software controlled uh, radio system or not? And if not, why? Right. Frank Uglier is one who's done most of the research for us for the radio system. It, I can tell you it's a digital uh, frequency system as opposed to our old analog radios, which gives us more flexibility. As far as what the back end component is that controls it, I don't think it's as sophisticated, centralized source as you, as you described. Each building gets a repeater, and the project really kind of evolved because we learned that there was a repeater. You know that mountain? down here in Fishkill where you see that large lit up cross every holiday season. Uh, apparently one of the antennas next to that large lit up cross had a repeater up there that we use every day, including today. Uh, and we, we discovered through uh, doing some research about the, the quality and, uh, and, and health check of our radio systems um, that no one's really paid rent for that reader, uh, repeater in quite some time. And the vendor, uh, when we made contact with them, said, oh God, you're still using that? We're, we're going to take that antenna down in, in another year or so, so you, you need to make, uh, we'll let you have it and keep going for a little while longer, but um, you need to uh, make preparations to replace the system. So, but I think it's more of a device specific, not, the technology is not that different than we use now, it's just digital as opposed to analog. Mrs. Perron. Yes, thank you. Um, should we be, uh, uh, should we, um, be able to find space in the elementary schools that do not have computer labs. Could this funding be put towards creating computer labs in those schools? If, if each school could find its, its initial space. The, the, the money itself could be allocated towards the creation of classroom space where there is, where you're eliminating modular classrooms but it's not, the, the, the intent of the money is specifically to buy hardware or anything out of those four categories only. Um, you, can't, you can't buy software, you can't, you know, it, it's very, very limited. Um, so it's all about buying gear, um, buying security upgrades. It, it will do capital stuff like, uh, you know, vestibule uh, additions um, or the replacement of modular classroom space. It's the only time you can actually construct additional space in the school. Mr. Um, I have some concerns with you know, kids on the computers a lot, but if we have extra time towards the end, I'll, I'll ask that question. My main concern, which I shared with fellow trustees um, and administration, is the reimbursement process. Um, it's a little concerning to me. I did a little research online found a couple of statements, uh, one from a local law firm that did an analysis where it says, issues surrounding bonding and indebtedness of school districts can be difficult and complicated, especially where, as here, Commissioner of Education and or the Division of Budgeting has yet to supply promised regulations or guidance. I then went to the schools, uh, Smart School Bond Act frequently asked questions, uh, the technology, security, and solutions provided by the website, uh, Q&A on the financial issues, does the reimbursement process begin 90 days after an invoice or 90 days after a TO is issued, which would be a purchase order? The state's answer is, the 90 days begins with the district's claim for reimbursement being approved in the online system. However, I would note that we, have, we fully intend to reimburse districts in less than 90 days. The department has invested significant techno technology and resources in ensuring that reimbursement occurs more quickly than that. That is my concern. If we could get an explanation of that uh, information that I looked online, there is no reimbursement. From a personal standpoint, I don't think there's enough money at this point where New York State is now going to go out and bond because it doesn't make sense because there aren't enough approved applications yet. And the fact that we have to lay out this money and not knowing when we're going to get this money and continue to do plans without having money come back is a huge concern to me. Do we have any additional information on that? Actually, last week I was at Questar State Aid Planning, which is a um, reference service that the district uses, and one of the questions was about safe, uh, Smart Schools Bond Act, I'm sorry, 
And we received affirmation that within the next week to 10 days, the website would be up. And of course, I have the same concerns because we've already made our payments. So now we will be past the 90 days, but it's only because we have not been able to submit our claims as of yet. Um, from the beginning, when the conversations began, we had, we had serious conversations about having any expenses that would be reimbursable after March 31st. 31st, because of the 90 day turnaround. We didn't want to have this crossover school years. These are all areas that we are concerned about. So yes, we would like to believe that we would be up and running as per New York State. They stay in their legislation 90 days. I know people don't always believe New York State, but we have to take something at face value as we move forward. I'd like to say too that um, on behalf of the Lower Hudson Council of School Superintendents, we're definitely fighting in terms of making sure that there's a push for the same concern that we all shared as superintendents for our school district. And it's a good thing we joined the legislative committee down there because then we can continue to advocate there as well if what um, Ms. Crandall mentioned doesn't really come to fruition. Mrs. Pelton. Just real quickly, um, the radio systems are absolutely outside of my wheelhouse, and I just want to know if this is including, if, if this is replacing the walkie-talkie systems that are being used at the schools, or is this not affordable? This will actually add to and improve our walkie-talkie system. Thank you. Mrs. Laval. I don't have a particular question, but I'd like to just share quickly with you um, an experience that I had this weekend. I had to pick my daughter up at her friend's house. She texted me the address at 9% battery on my phone, <laughs> and it died. And because everybody has a cell phone, there's no such thing as a pay phone. Mm -hmm. I had an idea where the house was, I went, I looked, I couldn't find it. I couldn't stop and make a phone call to find out where the address was. It was a half hour away from my home, five seconds away from where she was. Um, there's something to be said for tangible, um, you know, materials that we can look at and use. There's something to be said for the concern that, uh, you know, we have power failures, we have um, you know, equipment that wears, uh, the fact that the smart school bond uh, funds are limited. Once we spend them, we're going to have to replace this equipment. Um, and my other main concern is uh, something that Mr. Slosher alluded to. Uh, how much time are our kids spending on the computers? We just reinstated mandatory uh, handwriting, and cursive writing, because we know that, that uh, studies show that students' cognitive ability is improved and memory is improved when they write things out. Um, so, you know, how much time do we want them on uh, this equipment and not, uh, you know, working in a way that we know, um, you know works to their advantage in terms of cognitive ability and development? <coughs> Uh, our time allotted for discussion on this is up. If anyone wishes to make a motion to continue discussion, we can do so, or we can move on to the next item. Mr. Slowshower. I'd like to make a motion if we can extend for 10 minutes. Do we have a second? I can't hear that. I can't hear that. I'm sorry. I'd like to make a motion. No, sorry. Now? Sorry. I'd like to make a motion to extend the conversation for an additional 10 minutes. Second. Mrs. LaValle, all those in favor? Mr. Lumia, Mrs. Goodman, uh, Mrs. Karaf, Mr. Slowshower, did you your hand up, Mrs. Pelton, Mrs. LaValle, Mrs. Kelly. All those opposed? Mr. Galetta, Mr. Rubin. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Please keep track of it for us. All right, who wanted to talk? Uh, uh, if the, how many people want to speak? Mr. Slosha. I was just curious. 
curious if. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Slowshow, I thought it was very clearly explained and, and I, I understood it, so I'm okay. Mr. Slowshow. I, I just want to mention before, just continue what Trustee Laval was saying. Look, I, technology is important. I, I just I have a concern, and many parents in the district have a concern. Kids are on equipment and devices at home. Parents are trying to a certain degree to get their kids off, actually open up a book. We're bringing back cursive writing. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing with the kids on the computers. The experiences that I've had personally and what I've seen, I mean, are we actually sitting down and the kids are learning the functions of the keyboard, how to use it? I'm not seeing that and I haven't seen that. I would like to see, if possible, from the technology department or the curriculum, I'd like to see exactly what are we doing with the children? And there's different things going on throughout the district. There's no consistency that I've seen with regards to using computers. We get certain, uh, kids are getting certain assignments that are being done. They don't even know how to find things. So do we actually have some type of uh, curriculum or some type of lesson plan where just like in the old days when we took a typing class, you all got home row and we're on the book and we practice each key, key, keystroke and then combinations of keystrokes are we doing that first? Because all I see is we're running to do something on Google Docs for a social studies assignment, and nobody seems to know how to do that. And that's my concern. I understand technology is important. I want to have some type of mesh, but you know, when it says digital literacy skills, I'm looking a little bit more towards traditional literacy skills. We have a reading problem and a writing problem in this district at certain grade levels. We should be focusing on that first and then bringing in computers for kids. And I know with special ed, that's actually a benefit to them and helps them with their situations, but that's not every student. I, I don't, we, we seem to be getting away completely from a little bit of traditional learning, and traditional uh, uh, methodology uh, for the kids. You know, they're handing in papers, they don't even click spell check because they don't even know how to find spell check on the computer. This has been told to me by teachers in the high, at the high school level. So that's my concern. I'm not saying I'm not in favor of moving in this direction, but what my concern is, how much more are we throwing on? We're looking at the presentation saying four and a half hours a day uh, out of six and a half hours a day, or two or three days out of the week. And as Mrs. Laval said, with everything else that's being thrown at these kids, they need to read, write, make change, basic skills and computer skills being meshed in. So I would like to see moving forward if we're going to do this, I would like to see some, something in the curriculum that explains to parents what we're teaching the kids when it comes to computer skills. Because up to this point, personally, I have not seen it. Thank you. I think I saw Mrs. Laval's hand first, and then Mrs. Goodness. Mrs. Goodness? Oh, was there a response there? Um, Thank you, Mr. Schoen. Yes, actually, in grades three and four, we do have a structured digital literacy program called learning.com that our students all go through. And again, in seventh grade, they have computer applications at both junior highs, which is a mandatory grade class that they must also uh, participate in. All right, Mrs. Laval. Mrs. Goodman? Your comments I understand why you're making the comments you are, but this is a specific grant for technology. Should we not spend it? I mean, if you were talking about the general budget, that might make more sense. And the other thing I have to say is that some of the things you said argue for teaching kids. For example, to teach kids how to use Google Docs to teach kids how to use spell check and how not to use spell check. I get students putting in the wrong to, T-O, or T-W-O, or T-O-O all the time because spell check doesn't count it. It's spelled right. There are a lot of issues, I think, involved in teaching a kid how to use a computer, how to weigh its information, and I think maybe something that the board can think about is if we are buying this much technology for the district, 
maybe to, and maybe Mrs. P Trustee Pelton, you can think about this as well with your committee, to look at our technology policies and, and see if there's anything that needs to be added in terms of making sure that kids get an appropriate e education with it. Mrs. Laval. We hire highly qualified teachers, highly educated teachers. Um, they're professionals, and uh, they need to be able to operate in the classroom. And I just think it's, it's going to be very easy for these kids to stay on these computers. Um, it, it's water seeks its level if the teacher is busy with one student. Um, you know, the kids are going to be sitting on the computers. We, we, these kids need to be engaged. Um, and there's, there's opportunity, you know, we can set policy, but the reality is the teachers are in the classroom with the kids and the computers are there. Um, and they need to be engaged, like Mr. Slowshower said, um, you know, we're, our, our kids, they just they need to be engaged and we need not to just have them sitting there we're trying to get them off of the technology we know the dangers we know um you know they're a tool they're an opportunity we should use them but we should uh, consider them in a limited fashion um with regard to the fact that it's that it's a grant just because the money's there doesn't mean that we should get it and spend it and we don't have to we're authorized to do it, but it's, but there's no requirement that we spend this five million dollars and that we use it. There's just you know we can walk away from it. This is Pelton. I don't believe that there's anyone who doesn't share all the concerns that have been discussed um, on this topic. I would just like to take a moment to share a couple things regarding this because there's there's other other ways to look at it as well. I had a parent come to me in a parking lot with two binders that were either three and a half or four inch binders. And she said that she saved all of her fourth graders work from last year and wanted the board to be aware of how much paper that that child went through in one year. I, it's still in the trunk of my car. Um, but my, my point to that too is I, I can share another story that um, I have seen the benefits as well and um, with my own children to the extent that the teachers are engaging with my children and the teachers are teaching the subject and instead of coming home with this, I'm seeing my child log on to Google Chrome, I get to the assignments. It, it didn't change how it was taught to my child, it changes the fact that they can also hand it in right there at home, which is, which is really beneficial. I think the trick is, is balance. Um, but there's there's some very beneficial aspects to to having that type of access. Mr. Rubin. Thank you. Not a question, uh, but uh, I just recall, and whether it's applicable here or not in terms of the radio, it's called computer-defined software, and it never goes out of style. Whether it's applicable to this system or not, I'm not sure. Mr. Gary. Yeah, I agree that I agree we need to definitely look at balance. I know that um, you will see posted very soon um, the work that we will be doing in this district. And one of the things, too, is looking at how um, time is being managed, um, at, especially at the elementary school. In addition to that, it's happening countywide. Um, Dr. Michelle Cardwell and the rest of the curriculum and instruction teams in the in Dutchess County are really looking at managing scheduling time as um, one of the things that everyone found to deem to be important. I would also caution the fact that uh, we have a problem with reading and writing without any hardcore data to su substantiate that. We do utilize Teachers College, um, the Readers and Writers Workshop. We are able to monitor our students through the level of readers which is um, concrete books that they're turning pages to. Um, in addition to that, um, with, with the level readers, one of the things that I can say is that um, it's a lot more difficult to graduate from high school than it was when we went to high school, we had options. Non-Regents Diploma, Regents Diploma. 
Right now, I'm very happy to say that at John Jay High School, we're approaching maybe 96% of the graduation rate, which we haven't seen. And at Boise Ketchum High School, we're approaching a 90% graduation rate as well. Um, we could only do that if we're able to read and understand to be able to pass our algebra regents or geometry and our science regents and our English regents exams. So um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done and we are working on it, um, but um, definitely looking at a balance of what it is that um, we're talking about in terms of managing time and for instructional use and at the elementary level is something that we're doing as one of the concerns we saw as well as um, countywide is something that we're taking on to look at the use of time and how it's being utilized at the elementary level. Okay, the 10 minutes is up of extension. Did someone want to move to extend the time further? Okay, seeing no one. Uh, 6.03, approval of Smart Schools Bond Act preliminary implementation plan number three. Resolved that the preliminary Smart Schools Bond Act implementation plan number three shall be posted on the district website for at least uh, 30 days and comments on the plan shall be submitted to the email address plans at wcsdny.org. And be it resolved that a public hearing shall be conducted on the preliminary plan number three and be it further resolved that the Wappinger Central School District Board of Education hereby approves the preliminary Smart Schools Bond Act Implementation Plan number three as presented. Do we have a motion? Mr. Lumius, second. Mrs. Pelton, all those in favor? Mr. Galetta, Mr. Lumia, Mrs. Goodman, Mr. Rubin, Mrs. Kellen, Mrs. Karat, Mrs. Pelton, opposed? Mrs. Laval, abstention. Mr. Slowshow. 6.04, change in school start time presentation. that we've compiled through the process since November of 2015 on the district's website. We've included the Board of Education goal for 1617, which has been a focus as we move through this process. And we're aware of all the factors, community instruction program, efficiencies, and fiscal that impact this discussion as we move through it. We've provided a, a change in school start time and two-tier transportation historical timelines. That is something we'd like to share so that everyone can see the data and the path that we have taken as this conversation has moved through time. And I won't go through all of this, but I did want to indicate that there was a survey done um, for parents when we started this process, and there was another survey done in January of 2016 with regard to a change in two-tier transportation. And while we haven't included that information in these, in these presentation slides, that information is available online. In June of 2016, or the summer of 2016, I'm sorry, the superintendent also conducted a survey of local school superintendents as well with regard to school start changes. At the January 2016 Board of Education meeting, and again in June 2016, scenario four was presented to the board as the best option. And what that entailed, this scenario, is listed here on the screen. What we want to add is that this had the least impact to students and families. It met the board policy, the Board of Ed goal for 15-16, which it still meets for 16-17, and safety protocols. 
as we moved from January to, to September 2016, we looked at the change in start times. We've had a conversation with the regional superintendent of the New York State Archdiocese. We wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page, that private and parochial parents understood that we understood that transportation was important to them that there would be no change in, in parochial start times, that um, we would potentially have a change in start time. We wanted to make sure that that information was clearly shared, and that currently, Our Lady of Lourdes and St. Martin de Porres travel together on the same vehicle. So that's K through 12 students who do travel on the same vehicle together without issue or concern. And those are our vehicles that they transport on. We reviewed scenario four. We looked to see if there was any efficiencies that we could find to tighten it up. The transportation team has worked very hard in the midst of trying to get school um, runs ready for the 16-17 year and then pull this information together as well as we move forward. But we didn't find any criteria that we could change that would actually increase um, any efficiencies for scenario four as presented in the past. We also spoke to interscholastics at, or the interscholastic court directors as well as the principals at the high schools and the middle schools. Um, we had concerns. We have new sports teams that were added in the 16-17 budget. We wanted to see what impact that meant because we didn't increase the number of runs we have for the, for the sports teams. So that's a conversation we have to have going forward. We looked at possibly moving out of section one to section nine. Conversation only. It did not happen. It was just a conversation. Um, but we did look in to see if that was something that could help to alleviate stress if we were to um, change our start time. The reason why is because if we had a school start time that was any later, the 2.30 p.m. travel that would have to happen for those interscholastic teams would be severely impacted. And we've had other districts who, had a, who were going to uh, Wappinger's teams as home events say, you know what, we're going to be a little late because we're not pulling our students out any earlier from school in order to make the travel. A lot of these trips that the, our district teams have to make are an hour or longer um, because of the distance and the traffic that needs to be encountered as we move through these processes. Um, we do not remove students early from class in order to be able to attend interscholastic events, unless it's sectional or championship play, which is, uh, is not a normal standard occasion. And we also spoke to the building principals about extracurricular activities and what impact they thought there would, there would be with regard to off-campus responsibilities as well. We did website research into change of start times. As we looked at Arlington, who had an active conversation with regard to changing their start time of their high school to 7.30, from 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. or later. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis did not provide clear indication that AM, an a.m. start time would be beneficial, so Arlington took no action in March of 2016. Rhinebeck is currently piloting a program for 2016-17. They developed an ad hoc committee, they had the conversation with the board, with the community, and as such have this pilot program where they have moved their start time to 8 a.m. and they've also shortened their time between periods for students to travel from class to class so that the impact at the end of their day is not a full half hour. So we're interested to see how that works out as well. But again, Rhinebeck is, their middle school, high school campus is one building, um, so it's, it's different, but at least it's additional information for us to gather. As we continue to look at the change in start times, we wanted to provide you with a pictorial of what the current start times are for our school and what the proposed start times would be um, under scenario four for the two-tier transportation. Well, it wouldn't, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. It wouldn't matter what scenario we went with, the change in start time would be the change in start time and we would find the transportation system to work. So this is a proposed start time um, for all of the schools in our district. And again, we have no control over the private and parochial schools. Their start times are what they are, and we work within those limits. The superintendent did conduct a survey in the summer of 2016 as to, um, we got seven responses, as to what the start and end time for each level of their school is. And as you can see, that seven schools responded and if we were to shift our start time, we're the earliest. If we were to shift our start, our start time by a few minutes, we would actually be in alignment with several other local districts. 
So why does a change in start time and end time matter? Safety, as we have stated before, and we'll continue to state um, again and again, we really believe that that extra few moments of daylight is important to the safety of our students. We also would have enough time to make inclement weather calls. We would be able to add a one, two, and a three hour delay option, which currently the district does not have, which increases our safety. We've looked at um, the high school and middle start times to be more aligned with other districts in the county, five out of seven. We've also looked at the earlier elementary dismissal. Um, their, their dismissal time would be um, moved up, which would allow for extra time in the afternoon, which we've heard from parents was a concern. We've spoken to the Board of Education um, with regard to their fiscal responsibility and adherence to policy. And also, uh, compliance would be sustained. Now, we did receive several questions from members of the Board of Education, as well as a community member asking us a question through the day. So I'd like to try to address some of those as we move through this process. Um, the, one of the questions we received from the community was with regard to the length of time, instructional time, that students have. And the community, the community member was concerned that we weren't going to be having, we would be significantly reducing the minutes of education. And we wanted to just share that the WCT contract allows for teachers to work a seven hour work day. The teachers do not walk in at the same time students walk into the building. And the students and the teachers do not leave as the students are boarding the bus. So there is a seven day, seven hour work day, but there's a six minute hour and 40 minute instructional period that we're looking to maintain with this change in start time. So it takes five to seven minutes to, to bring students in and it takes up to 10 minutes for students to be able to uh, dismiss from a building, correct, Superintendent? Yeah, um, and, and one of the things that we are looking at is also the dismissal process from a safety perspective and also from um, a, a process procedure, um, how, how they conduct their dismissal process. This would allow us to then, um, so what we're looking at right now is the average time that it takes for one school to, for a school to dismiss, especially at the elementary level. And what we have seen historically for many years is that they vary in time significantly. I mean, to a great extent for being one school district. Um, and working as an elementary school principal in two different schools, one was that was rather right large, I know that we were able to do the dismissal in five minutes. Um, but overall, when you really think about six hours and 40 minutes of students being in school, so it's not that the six hours and 40 minutes include the dismissal process. After the six hours and 40 minutes, the dismissal process begins. So you're not really talking about um, a lot of time. Quite frankly, teachers can't walk in at the same time students are walking in, and that takes, as Ms. Crandall mentioned, five to 10 minutes um, in terms of getting settled in. Let's, let me just say kudos to all of our teachers who are in school sometimes an hour and two hours beforehand because they like to really prepare um, in the morning. But the reality is they have a seven hour workday. So six hours and 40 minutes is extremely realistic in terms of the time that students are spending in a school building. With that said, um, we will be answering that question and providing more clarity to this particular question that came to you as a board and came to administration um, to really uh, make sure that we really answer that question in detail. In addition to that, we've received 20 questions, which you all have a hard, um, um, okay, that you all have a hard copy for, and questions nine and ten right now are: um, Have we spoken to local daycare after school business to see if there is any impact with them? Example: Tots and us. Yes, in October, November 2015, the district reached out to several local daycare providers. They were not concerned with our change in start time. We indicate that if this was to be approved, we should share this information as early as possible. Question 10, have we spoken to high school students to see what they think since they may have other school jobs 
besides extra after school activity, sports, etc., etc. We surveyed parents, we did not survey students. We are hopeful that any changes to be made would allow for plenty of time for students to make arrangements with their employers. But nevertheless, that's one of the things that we will be doing is conducting that student survey. Um, the other piece, um, change in start times. As I said, so this, this top piece has already been addressed by looking at it from the six hour and 40 minute day for student learning, as opposed to we are not discussing um, the seven hour day that the teachers are mandated to work in our district. Um, <clears throat> why? So how does a change in start time relate to a two-tier system? It increases our alignment with other local districts. It provides an, each, an, an equal educational setting, that six hour and 40 minutes that we discussed. And we did confirm with, with all, of the, all of the schools in the district as to what their instructional time was. So how long were students in their seat barring dismissal? Um, and the junior highs were actually at six minutes and 41, six hours, 41 minutes. Um, so it is six hours and 40 minutes that we've looked uniform to create across the district. Uh, we have a fiscal diligence if we were to go to a two-tier system, an approximate savings of $280,000. We have compliance with New York State law and board policy 8410, and it buys us that additional time to make safety calls with regard to weather, one, two, and three hour delays. Some of the other questions that we received from the Board of Education um, through today's email was about traffic and WAP Junior RCK being two miles apart in a very, very busy intersection. Um, we did have a conversation in October of 2015 with local village town officials, um, departments of transportation. We shared this idea that there may be a change in start time. We shared that it would be the middle schools potentially going to the same tier as the high schools. Um, we asked them what their, any fears, any concerns that they had. We also shared with them that we would be making sure that they were given as much notice as possible as well. Um, we did not receive any feedback from the town or the village that said, or villages that they were concerned. Um, remember, we're not dumping all of the buses into one space. It is a corridor. They said traffic moves. They're, they're, they were not concerned. But of course, we will have continued conversations. Um, with regard to the pickup times for students in the morning, would we be losing that 15 minutes, 13 minutes that we're looking to buy because of additional traffic concerns? We have, a, we have routed our, our buses in the scenarios to um, be 10 minutes earlier so that there is that 10 minutes time that we are looking to um, grab at the start of the school day for safety to make sure that, as well, that students have that opportunity to be in the daylight for just a little bit longer. Um, so there was a question about um, what if a what if a parent had to pick up a student at uh, WAP Junior and RCK at dismissal? Now it's going to be the same time. How would that be impacted? We currently have that now. We have a student who goes to Myers and a student that goes to WAP Junior, same or family, Van or Van Wyck. Um, that is something we have to be aware of, that that parents currently juggle as we move through the process. There were a few questions that did not pertain to this conversation that were not pertinent at this time. So we'll have that discussion at another time as well. Um, there was a question about our bus drivers. Um, is it true that we have part-time drivers who would potentially be losing overtime so or, or pay as a result of this change? Our bus drivers are part-time. They drive five hours a day. Our packets are built to be five hours a day. That's in line with the union, con the union that's in line with the contract. That's something that we're very aware of. And we're looking to continue that process as we move through. Um, with regard to parents from parochial schools, while we haven't had direct conversations with them, we while we haven't had direct conversations with them beyond the survey that was done in January 2016, we did ask those parents to review that information because a lot of their concerns were answered during the presentation. So that's why we have this ongoing conversation with the um, regional superintendent. She's aware that the presentation was happening this evening. So that if there were questions, hopefully she can funnel that information through her principals or come to us and we'll be definitely willing to provide any feedback. And all of these questions will be available online. Um, 
we had a question about the tier one and two now being at the same time, meaning the high schools and the junior highs at the same time. And there will be buses that travel the same routes. But because our schools are not close enough together, we can't run the high school and middle school either on the north end with RCK and Wap Jr. or on the south end with Van Wyck and John Jay at the same time. So we have to have them routed separately. Um, are less buses being used? Transportation rerouted every student. And we made sure that every student had a seat. And if every student is being transported now, we made sure that every student is transported under the new system and that we do have the vehicles in order to make that scenario work, scenario four. Um, we got asked a question about if a bus broke down. So if a bus broke down, what would happen? Currently a bus breaks down, a mechanic and a replacement bus, bus go to the site. That would happen again. Sometimes things need to be shuffled today to have that happen. But it does happen and we do move forward with that. Um, adequate time between bus runs for inclement weather? Yes, we will have enough time. And, okay. Will ride times be the same or longer? The average ride time will be the same. When we discussed this in November and January, we made sure to address the bus ride times and policy 8410, which addresses the length of time that a student can be on a vehicle. And um, nothing has changed with regard to those previous discussions. The scenario that we had originally discussed does remain the same. Also, as part of the conversation, we looked to see if we could do a north-south split um, to try to make it a little bit cleaner as we move through the process. As you can see, that doesn't work for Wappingers. Um, Arlington does have a clear north-south north split, but they have their compounds much closer together um, and, and their schools, the way their schools fall, they can. That's not something that's available to Wappingers. Um, we've already discussed that scenario four was within policy. We've discussed the goals. Um, we have shared with the Board of Education um, our fleet size and we've received a FOIL request, which we'll be working on that as well to provide an answer to the public with regard to the size of our fleet and the distribution of our fleet at each of the schools. Um, we have um, shared with the board that we would be potentially having to have a conversation about the types of vehicles that we'll be purchasing in 1718. We've purchased small vehicles the past few years to meet needs of students. We will probably need to purchase more larger vehicles as a result, um, but not increase the overall proposition. We do have an aging fleet. It's something we need to address as we continue through. Uh, we've reviewed preventative maintenance. We've also refreshed data on absenteeism for drivers. There was a concern as we went through the process in the spring. We did uh, uh, just a quick review of um, sunrise time and sunset times and um, just so you can see that we don't have students in the morning, and if the chime was to change to 717, that would technically be um, in the, in the I'm sorry, 730, we wouldn't have any students who would be in the, in the dark before sunrise. So we have a recommendation to include a resolution for October 17th. This is a recommendation, it is at the will of the board. This does not need to occur on that date. The reason for this recommendation, just quickly, was because we did say, and I remember last year, that we wanted to give parents ample time, but quite frankly, this is not a hard recommendation of any sort. This could be a continued conversation, um, as I shared with the board, um, in terms of, of questions that you may want to think about, reflect, and we can get those answers to you, but we don't want to wait a very long time to come up with a decision. We also have um, a, a, a additional next steps, this time um, besides that second bullet that we have, and where's... We have, we have a forum, which are here. Oh. So we have a community forum. So the, the page that was supposed to get added um, was to indicate that part of the next steps um, are a community forum, to discuss this and provide parents a town hall um, to provide parents the opportunity to really share information as opposed to having a come to the mic moment for three minutes and talk and really have a Q&A dialogue. In addition um, to that, 
we're looking to also survey parents, poll students, and um, these are all the things that we delineated with um, our public relations person. And um, we were supposed to have this one page to really show you. It'll be on our website tomorrow, and you will be able to see it posted how we're gonna continue to move forward so that everybody can have a voice as we move forward. And thank you for some of your recommendations to really make sure that um, if this is going to be the will of the board, this is how we're going to move. There's one more piece too that I'd like to say is that you know there's that real push and I agree. I'm so excited that we have cursive writing. I'm really excited that we have opportunities for your students to have field trips. Those days have been gone for many students and those are such enriching experiences. But when you have a three-tier um, bus schedule, we are so limited to the time that we can provide students to go on a field trip because they have to get back by a certain time. The window is so short for, for these type of experiences for students to have, which then in turn results in having to contract out and trying to get buses that are super expensive, um, more so than if we were conducting those field trips ourselves. So that would really increase the opportunity for students to, um, to, to partake in field trips. And one of the other pieces too that with the three tier, I think we also, um, we, we have to continue to make sure that we're getting to um, daycare centers, um, so on and so forth, that are not even within the boundary of the school district. So once you get started at the high school, sometimes you have to make sure that some of these buses get out of here, get out of the school right away, because they have to get now to the third tier, let's say from the middle school, and make sure that if they're going north back from a situation to, to get students traveling further distances that are outside of their boundaries. And that would really also help with decreasing that amount of time and how sometimes, and this is a reality, I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, but historically in some of these areas, we've had buses that leave slightly earlier to get students out there. So what we're really looking is to really have a six hour, 40 minutes minimum. And of course, if students get there earlier, they're able to, to go into their classes. Uh, we have used up uh, more than our 20 minutes that were allotted for this. Uh, I know most people submitted questions in advance, which Mrs. Crandall and Mr. Carrion have been trying to answer. Uh, if you would like to ask more questions at this time, we need a motion for extended time. Mr. Rumia moved. Mrs. Zaval second. How, what was the time limit that you were extending it for, Mr. Rumia? Five minutes, okay, and uh, Mrs. Laval seconded. How many in favor? Mr. Galetta, Mr. Lumia, Mrs. Goodman, Mrs. Kellen, Mrs. Karras, Mr. Slowshower, Mrs. Pelton, Mrs. Laval, opposed? Mr. Rubin. All right, five minutes, Would you please keep track for us, Mrs. Mrs. Pedro, thank you. Okay, whose question? Mr. Lumia. I would like to have the question that both Mr. Slashauer and myself to be part of the record so that people in the community actually see the, the responses. Not only about Mr. Mr. Slashauer and myself, but also Mrs. Sattler was able to take this. She posed the question. All the questions were answered. I would like those questions to be part of the record as, as well as the answers. I, I believe I share that with you this afternoon. I know, but it's going to be, it's gonna be, it's it's gonna be posted. Be it's going to be posted. Just Yep, you will see it. We, uh, uh, out of respect to the board, we wanted to share it with you first and then make sure that it gets posted. I said, and I have, you know, I have a lot of reservations. I, I really do. The question is that do we have enough buses? If, there's a, if the weather is anything the weather, is there enough time to go pick up and go back and pick up? You know? I assume those things that you've answered that. And, and yes, one of the questions was that. Uh, you said you set up a bus driver, not a bus driver, but a mechanic as well as a bus. The question is, if I do it to your system, will we have enough buses to send? Yes. Do we have extra bus? The answer was yes. I just said we hope that's the case.
This is a love. Can you explain what private and parochial schools rooted separately to these respective schools? Um, what that, how that works? Yes, right now, um, to, to use the word, the parochial students, private and parochial students, have exclusive runs. So there you don't run with students that, um, that attend any of our 15 public schools. We also looked at all, uh, many of the school districts in the county, whereas many of the students that attend private and parochial schools ride with the students um, um, from, from their public schools. We will continue to maintain that, and what we would do is, right now is, we call it hubbing, right? Um, a, a, a few schools hub, where they meet at a certain location, and they continue on with um, transportation. So the different, what would happen here, it would happen with all the private and parochial schools, and at the end of the school day, if you want me to explain that, you can do a better job at that than I can. At, at the end of the school day, we would look to route approximately 327 students from Our Lady of Lords and St. Martin de Porres onto our elementary school runs. So those students would be would go to each of their respective schools and be put on runs to to um, transport home. My, my children don't, aren't in the elementary school anymore, but just for an example, I live in Fishkill, my kids went to St. Mary's in Fishkill. Are they going to St. Columba now, or are these students coming from another area? Uh, I'm just wondering how the hubbing is working it's in the morning. It is, the hubbing is going to work as it, it, it works now. Um, it's, it's exactly the same. So it's not like all of the parochial schools are suddenly being hubbed? Not at all. Okay. In the morning. What currently occurs is going to continue to occur, and some schools do hub. We do have them transported in, 14 building, 14 buses come together. Okay, Mr. Slow Shadow. Two quick things. One, I want to thank uh, Ms. Crandall and uh, Ms. Carrion and administration. I submitted uh, 15 questions and received answers probably within an hour today, so I'd like to commend you, uh, both and everyone else from administration, for getting the information back to me and the other board members in such a timely fashion. I believe the same goes for Trustee Loomis questions. I would like to respectfully request that uh, the board does not make any uh, vote one way or the other on this particular uh, item until we first have uh, a uh, public forum. I think we owe it to the community to again hear what they have to say, get some additional information, get some other questions answered that the board members may have, and then once we've reached that point, then put it up to the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have our date, October 16th. No, 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 no. October 5th. October 5th, I apologize, and we will, 7 o'clock, and we'll start posting everywhere as of tomorrow. Again, amazing how quickly. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Mrs. Caron. The $288,000 in savings is an annual savings, correct? It would be an annual savings, $280,000 is an estimate, and it would be a one-time savings because, again, you make the reduction that savings would um, be a one-time, not year after year. It would be a cumulative savings, but it is annual. Well, what I can say about that, too, is that um, just so you know, Kristen and I usually have this discussion, and um, I'm learning from my own personal finance now that one thing is always only a one-time savings. So that's the, that's the conversation, and that's why many school districts, you hear like it's an annual savings. Kristen will share with you, when you save, you save once. So it's not, I don't know if it's, a, it's, it's being more technical, semantics, we... I don't want people to think it's gonna be 560,000 next year. That's, so it's 280,000. Each, each, <laughs> each year. Each year. Each year it'll be 280,000. Right. Well, but I, I think it's uh, important to make that clarification. Yes. Okay, uh, we uh, ran out of time again. Mrs. Goodman, if you'd be very quick, and then if we want more time, we'll extend time. Uh, 
Uh, that would be nice, actually. I don't know if I can, but I'll try. Um, I'm new to the board, so I wasn't part of the process last year, but I absolutely admire it. Um, I think the way you've involved everybody and you have your mastery is terrific. I think the community forum idea is terrific. One thing that I would like to ask is we are talking about changing the daily routines of every family that doesn't have a driving teenager. And so I'd like to err on the side of too much contact with parents than too little. So, you know, maybe just as one example, um, and then I'll leave the rest to God, you competent people, it is to notify parents that this stuff is up on the website so that they can check it out for themselves. Thanks. Uh, is there anyone who wants to extend time? Okay, then let us move on to the consent agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to remove anything from the consent agenda? Mr. Rubin. On item 7.02, only line items 15, 16, 18, and 19. Is there anything else anyone wishes to remove from the consent agenda? On 7.02. <laughs> 15, 16, 18, and 19. 17, 18. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Then, um, and consent agenda. Do we? Resolved that the Board of Education does hereby approve the following consent agenda items as stated. As stated, 7.02 as amended, except for items nine items 15, 16, 18, and 19, 7.03, 7.04, 7.05, 7.06, 7.07, 7.08, 7.09, and 7.10. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Goodman, second. Mr. Slowshower, all those in favor? Unanimous. 7.02, item spot line items 15, 16, 18, and 19. Do we have a motion? Mr. Rubin, second. Mrs. Pelton, discussion. Mr. Rubin. Carry on my concern about that was that, well, that and I have no problems with these with these people, but they're listed as an annual salary as an example line item 15, an annual salary of 975 per hour, and you can have it. Those can be listed as hourly salaries. That's correct. If they were if they were changed to say hourly salaries, that would be I would accept that. Can we? It should say hourly. Salary. So the word annual should be removed. Yes, you, you can't have an annual salary. Okay. okay, could we have a motion to amend it by removing the word annual from those items? Mr. Rumi, second. Mrs. Pelton, all those in favor? Unanimous. All right, thank you. All right, uh, any further discussion on this? All right, all those in favor of approving the amended line items 15, 16, 18, and 19. Unanimous. Eight point zero one, approval of Cold War veterans exemption. Be resolved by the Board of Education of the Wappinger Central School District, parentheses district, as follows. Whereas section 458-B of the real property tax law has been amended by chapter uh, 253 of the laws of the state of New York to permit school districts the authority to grant partial real estate, partial real property tax exemptions 
to el eligible veterans of the armed forces who served between September 2nd, 1945 and December 26, 1991, parentheses, Cold War veterans exemptions. And now therefore be resolved that the Board of Education of the Wappinger Central School District does hereby establish and grant the Cold War veterans exemption from real property taxes for a qualifying residential real, real property owned by veterans, their spouses, and the unremarried su surviving spouse of veterans as follows. One, an exemption equal to 15% of the assessed value of such property, provided, however, that such exemption may not exceed the lesser, God bless you, the lesser of A, $8,000 or B, the product of eight, the product of eight thousand dollars multiplied by the latest state equal, equalization rate for assessing unit where such property is situated. Two, in the event the veterans receive a compensation rating from the United States Department of Veterans Affairs or from the United States Department of Defense because of service-connected disability, an additional exemption equal to the product of the assessed value of such property multiplied by 50% of the veteran's disability rating, provided, however, that such exemption shall not, such exemption shall not exceed the lesser of A, $40,000, or B, uh, the product of $40,000 multiplied by the latest state equalization rate for the assessing unit where such property is situated and be it further resolved that this resolution shall be effective as of March 1st, 2017 and shall apply to all real property taxes levied by the Wappinger Central School District based on assessed rolls prepared after such date and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be submitted to each assessor responsible for preparing the assessment role listing all real property situated within the Wappinger Central School District. <laughs> the other creating exception for those members of the National Guard who served under Operation Graphic Hand has been had passed both the Assembly and Senate but is still awaiting action by the governor. All right. Do we have a motion? Mr. Slow Show. Second. Mrs. Corral, discussion. I, I have some questions. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, is this exemption also granted by municipalities and yes. the county? Yes, ma'am, as far as we as we're aware. Okay. Do you know of any that have already done so? I do not, but I can definitely look into it and provide the board with any type of information. Remember, this is very new. <laughs> I don't even know what'll be on their agendas, but this is a very new piece of legislation that was just passed. Uh, do you have any idea of how this will affect the other taxpayers who will, of course, pay the additional money to make up the total uh, budget requirements? In January of 2014, the district passed the alternative veterans um, exemption. At that time, we could not tell you as well. We still cannot tell you um, as to what it will be. It is a, a, an exemption that is added by the taxpayer themselves. There is no records kept by the receivers or the assessors as to who is a veteran and who is not. Um, if they have not applied for the exemption, there's not. I cannot provide you with any type of data. Matter of fact, we weren't even able to provide the board with any data until this past summer with regard to what occurred in January of 2014 because it is a year and a half out by the next, by the time that that information is gathered. Okay, because uh, we, uh, I have heard from community members, and I saw a, a letter in the Poughkeepsie Journal in the last week. Uh, people wondering why, if there's a two percent property tax cap, their taxes go up well over two percent, and of course that's because of assessments, and assessments are you know, influenced by this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another question I have, is anything being done for veterans who are renters? Renters are not taxpayers in the district. They're not homeowners. Uh, yeah, but they pay taxes in their rent unless they have an increase.
incredibly philanthropic landlord. And, and it's not, um, as far as I'm aware right now, there's no exemption for renters available. All right, so that if the, the landlord is a, uh, is a veteran, uh, he would get an exemption right. from his taxes. Mm -hmm. So potentially you could pay lower rent if he passed it on. <laughs> and potentially, uh, potentially. Potentially. There's no obligation for the landlord to do But there is so. no obligation. Correct. And the veteran who is a renter um, gets no advantage if his uh, landlord, whether his landlord is or is not a veteran. Okay, uh, just a minute and then we'll get to you, Mr. Slowshower. I just had another, another point. Uh, okay, I'll get to it. Okay, so um, it seems to me that it's unfortunate that the state of New York, the New York State Legislature, does not uh, give direct benefit to veterans mm -hmm. so that all veterans could benefit. Uh, I know historically after World War I, the state legislature gave bonuses to everyone who served in World War I, and it seems as though that would be a more equitable way of recognizing and honoring our veterans. Okay. Mr. Slowshower. In, in my opinion, any benefit that we can give to a veteran, I, I don't there needs to be that much you know, debate about it. I mean, we can't even, you know, the sacrifices that veterans make, if this is something that helps them and their family, I, I don't, I'm not opposed to that. I would just like to ask Ms. Cranley just to clarify, veterans have to apply. Yes, sir. Okay. And there is a time limit on this exemption, whereas the alternative exemption did not have it. So, so they would have to reapply after 10 years. So we, again, that the dollar amount is unknown because we're, we're not sure how many veterans we actually have and how many of those veterans would actually apply for this right. exemption. Right, the impact to the towns is unknown at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question I have, um, uh, since I worked in a real estate office when I was in college. Uh, when you buy a house, uh, one of the selling points is the property taxes. Would it be indicated to buyers uh, that a veteran's ex uh, that the property tax paid was by a veteran and, and therefore that their tax to, to pay would be higher? And conversely, if uh, so a veteran was buying a house, would they uh, show them what the proper, um, property tax might be with their exemption? Because this has a real effect on the asking price of a house, since most people have to consider property tax when they consider what mortgage they can handle. I don't think it's our job to, to talk about this nonsense. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm in favor of passing the, re the, the resolution. Everything else is not the court's responsibility to find out exactly what you're talking about. Let's, let's move on, please. I'll second that. Any other comments? Mrs. Laval? Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say, Mr. Lumia, that I felt it was important that the public understands when we do charitable or good things that if there is a cost, and that they're aware of what might be the ramifications so that they don't assume that everything is free since everything does have a balancing cost. And even though we honor and respect our veterans and like to help them, I think it is important that the public understand that somebody else is paying for this. Eight point zero two. Acknowledge receipt of financials, June twenty sixteen. Resolved that the Board of Education does hereby acknowledge receipt of the June two thousand sixteen financial reports. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Pelton, second. Mrs. Laval. All those in favor? Unanimous. 8.03, approval of municipal advisor, capital markets. Resolve that the Board of Education does hereby renew capital markets to continue to represent the district as a municipal advisor as detailed in a memo dated September 20th, 2016, 
from the Executive Director of Finance and Business Development to the Superintendent of Schools. Okay, do we have a motion? Mrs. Kamal, okay. second. Mrs. Pelton, discussion? All those in favor? Just one quick question. Yes, Mr. Lillian. Did anybody else apply for this particular uh, Mrs. Crandall? Um, with regard to these services, nobody else applied. We've been working with them for years. I know that's not an answer to continue working with them, but they provided us a sound service. We're happy with their service, and we want to move forward. That's right. All those in favor? Unanimous. 8.04, approval of the lease purchase agreement with PCF. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Washington Central School District approves a lease, a, a lease purchase agreement with PCF Equipment Finance, a division of PCF National Bank, for the acquisition of one Toro Grandmaster 360 four-wheel drive lawnmower with attachments and accessories uh, from Grassman Equipment and Irrigation Corporation which equipment was competitively bid and awarded previously uh, by the Board of Education, by, excuse me, by the Board on August 15, 2016. In the, in the principal amount of $31,558.80, to be financed over a 60-month period at the approximate interest rate of 3.59%, and further authorizes the President, District Clerk, and Executive Director of Finance and Business Development to sign and execute all documents related to such lease purchase agreement. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Pelton. Second. Mrs. Goodman. Discussion? Mr. Lewis. Just a quick question. We're renting this for thirty seconds. Sorry, Christian. Don't want please. <laughs> I'm sorry to ask this question sooner, but it seems to me we're renting or we're leasing for 30, approximately 32000 Why not purchase? It is a lease purchase. It's a lease to purchase. A lease to purchase? Yes. So, so it is a lease purchase. And the reason why it has to come back to the board is just because this additional resolution. Lease purchase okay. Yes, sir. So we I'm will sorry. own it at the end of the time. That's fine. Okay, thanks. Thank you. That could be better. <laughs> 8.05, approval to so attend. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> All right, any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. 8.05, approval to attend Commissioner's Roundtable. Resolve that the Board of Education does hereby approve that Board President Peggy Kelly attend the Commissioner's Roundtable meeting with SED Commissioner Mary Ellen. Malaya on Friday, September 30, 2016 in Latham, New York, and be a further result that the Board of Education hereby gives consent to Board President Peggy Kellen to provide input on the district on the district's most pressing school health and safety issues. Do we have a motion? Mrs. Pelton, second. Mrs. Carra, uh, just for your information, uh, I sent out a uh, a copy of their survey to the board and to the senior administrators and I have gotten back answers from some people. If any of the rest of you have something you'd like to pass on to me before Friday, uh, please do so and I'll let her know if I get a chance. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion or questions? Mr. Rubin. I'd just like to say that in my opinion, I believe that sending you there is in line with our mission statement something everything on the agenda should be and does support. Okay. All those in favor? Mr. Galetta, Mr. Rumia, Mrs. Goodman, Mr. Rubin, Mrs. Kellett, Mrs. Karab, Mrs. Pelton, opposed? Mrs. Laval, abstention? Mr. Slowshower? Eight point zero six approval to attend the committee on practitioners meeting. 
Resolved that the Board of Education does hereby approve Board Vice President Robert Rubin to attend the Committee of Practitioners meeting on Wednesday, October 5 in Latham, New York, and be it further resolved that the Board of Education hereby gives, hereby gives consent to Board Vice President Robert Rubin to help advise staff at the New York State School Boards Association as to what recommendations NISBA should provide to the uh, State Education Department related to the best manner in which the state should implement the Every Student Succeeds Act in New York State. Okay, we have a motion. Mrs. Talbot, second. Mr. Galletta, discussion. Mr. Lumi. Would there be more than one person to go to this particular meeting? Uh, no, well, uh, in both cases, they reached out to us and invited us personally. So for all I knew, they could pick names out of the hat. So uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't, we weren't told as a board we could send someone because they weren't representing all the boards. They just sent it and reached out to us. So we thought it'd be good to take the opportunity to share your concerns with the, the, you know, the state is giving us an opportunity. Lobbying is always good. Okay, uh, any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Ah, oh, yes, Mrs. Carrasco. Mr. Rubin, would you like us to email you our concerns and uh, things that we would like you to discuss? Please. Okay, all those in favor? Mr. Galletta, Mr. Lumia, Mrs. Goodman, Mr. Rubin, Mrs. Kellen, Mrs. Karat, Mrs. Pelton. Opposed? Mrs. Laval, abstention? Mr. Sojow. 8.07, first reading of policies 2120.1, 4325, 4327, 4334.1, 4526, 4526.1, 4531, 4532, 4714, and 4773. Do we have a motion? Uh, oh, it's so just reading. We don't really need a motion, just that we read it, so everybody sees it. If anybody has any comments, please submit them to the district so that they can be considered for questions. Okay, okay number 9.01. Board members may request additional agenda items, discussion items, or requests for information. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Mr. Rubin. Discussion item, uh, but I would hope to carry on at some future point, at uh, near future point, you could uh, uh, give us further information on flag protocol within the district and the uh, update on flags. Uh, excuse me, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's not an agenda item. Okay, if you could just ask him, he'll be happy to do it, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Anything else? All right, 10.01, communicate comments from the public. Please limit your time at the mic to three minutes. At this time, you may speak on any item that has to do with school district business. Good evening, my name's Warren Cassidy. Um, I have still concerns with this start time, um, changing start time. Um, some of it is that traffic issue. Um, and I know one of the answers was that you spoke with town officials. Um, in your answer, if you could list the actual officials that you spoke to, so that maybe it was a secretary who doesn't have a true knowledge of the traffic pattern in that area, or was it the town board supervisor, um, and kind of see, gauge the, the level of expertise that person who answered that question actually has. Um, and have there been any traffic studies recently on that road, on that stretch of Myers Corners there, because anybody that has driven that area at that time in the morning will tell you the traffic is crazy. There's commuter traffic, there's bus traffic, there's, you're now asking staff from both buildings to be there at the same time. That traffic is going to impact 9D, it's going to impact 9. The traffic light from Hanover on 9 there 
crossing over Middle Bush is not in sync with the, the traffic light there at the old, whatever it is, by Bernie the Bear. Those traffic lights are not in sync. You're getting stuck between them. Coming up 9D, you're going to have buses that are going to Van Blank, Bob Jr., and Ketchum. Because the, I believe the kids that come down from Osborne Hill and stuff like that, I don't know if any of those buses are rounded up that way, but there is the potential. So I really think that that traffic pattern there really needs a little bit more of an extensive research other than, hey, Wappinger's Town Hall, do you have any concerns? I would like to know who you spoke to, what type of questions are really asked, and if there really is any traffic studies from that area that have been done. As board members, sit in one of those parking lots there and just watch that traffic at that time, and then go over and watch the traffic at Wap Jr. <coughs> for parents picking up or dropping off. For Wap Jr., we got to circle around to this side, which means we can't come across Middle Bush. We got to go up nine, or we do come across Middle Bush and then circle back behind through the village. So it's going to impact village traffic. So it has a lot more of an impact than just that tiny little stretch of a road. The other thing I'm concerned is with the number of buses. I think that the buses are slated for a certain number of, of people. I think you should actually pull a bus up to district office and put as many of you adults on that bus because that's what these high school students look like and have your work bags and your lunch bags and get on that bus and see how many people truly fit on that bus not what the number on the side of the bus says, but what a physical, actual human being sitting on that bus is like. Three kids across in those seats at the elementary level is very crowded. Three seats in the high school and the junior high, you're looking for behavioral problems. Look at how packed those buses are really going to be during this rerouting. And I really question 17 minutes, 13 minutes start time making a true difference in terms of our bus rides. I think our bus rides are going to be longer. I think there's going to be less bus stops. I think they're gonna be more crowded bus stops. I think a little more research really has to go into, yes, on paper this looks great, but in the actual day-to-day, -day, um, it actually panning out, what is this actually gonna look like? So I just ask that you take the time to actually do that. Did anyone else have something to say? Okay. All right. Then could we have a motion to adjourn? Mrs. Pelton, second. Mrs. Kalant, all those in favor? Unanimous.